welcome to the 15th episode of the fifth season of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 25th of September and in this episode we're going to talk about the Amazon shopping lens brouhaha and <laughs> we'll have a look at some of the um, entries for the competition results and announce who's won the competition. Ooh. We will of course cover the latest news, events, bits about Ubuntu, tomorrow's technology today and we'll go over your feedback. If you're listening live you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Laura and joining me tonight are Mark. Hello. Alan. Hello. And Tony. Good evening. <laughs> Mark, Always one. what have you been up to? What have I been up to? Um, That's what she said. I fixed the uh, the countdown on the website, so now it's easier to read. And accessible. Ooh, when did you do that? Uh, I did that um, about three o'clock this afternoon when I remembered I said I'd get it done for this episode. Excellent. Excellent. Mission accomplished. Achievement yes. unlocked. Well done. Yes. <laughs> What about you, Alan? Um, I uh, fixed my first thing with Suguru. Oh, you mentioned it to me last yes. time I was on the, uh, here in the studio, and um, I bought some Suguru, and I fixed our um, what's that called? Uh, clothes source washing the thing you put washing on to dry. Yeah, clothes source. Yes. Yeah, the metal yeah. things busted, so I fixed. Oh, cool. so what, it. what is Suguru for the benefit it's, of the listeners who weren't in on your conversation last it's, week? It's really. Oh yeah, we didn't talk <laughs> oh, about yeah, it on there. Right. <laughs> just, just Google Sugu. S U G R U. It's, it's like a, um, like Fimo or play doh stuff. Is. No, yeah, yeah, a lot like, of people know what Fimo is. Though. Oh, okay, I don't. Sort of, uh, it's like rubbery yeah. stuff, and then you mold it into a shape, and it'll fix something. It air dries, doesn't it? Yeah, it takes twenty four hours to dry, but you get them in little vacuum sealed, like five gram amounts uh-huh. and you cut it open and they come in different colors and then you mold it to whatever you know they've got loads of uses on the on the website you blend and stuff. the colors together but also the other thing is i've been playing a game called nikki and the robots which is brilliant it's a open source game oh it's open source is it lgpl yeah. hosted on launchpad Ooh. and uh you can buy levels for the game cool and it's a pay what you want thing Cool. And there's also community levels as well. So you, there's a map editor built in, so you can make your own levels and contribute them. <laughs> it's really, really, and it's a brilliant game as well. It's really, really old retro, eight bit style, um, a twitch kind of jump and things, and you fall down and you die, and you start from the beginning of the level, and it's just brilliant. I love it. And the music's great, and the kids love it. Excellent. So, yeah, it's worth cool. worth, worth buying the levels for that. Cool. Excellent. Oh, um, I've been updating my talk for Skycon. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Skycon? What's Skycon? That? Well, we'll cover that in our event segment in just oh, a few yeah. minutes' time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm updating my existing talk that I did for uh, originally back in 2009. Um, <laughs> a few things that have come out of it that have amused me, such as the bit where he's, I said, um, people appreciate good audio quality, but... Uh, people sur- really appreciate good audio but, quality. But, well, this bit was, but are surprisingly tolerant of bad audio. <laughs> <laughs> Not <Our> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I did wonder, to pause to reflect on whether, that, yeah, because now that proper radio stations are involved in podcasting things where the people's expectations are higher than they were yeah, uh, or yeah. our audience has increased and people are a bit more kind of fussy or whatever so yeah that was interesting what about you laura i went to the circus really <laughs> Can you? yeah an actual clowns circus with clowns acrobats mm. it was very cool what here near here yeah near here oh wow yeah animals yeah. and no there was don't a dog. like circuses with animals oh, there was okay. a oh yeah there was a dog it was brilliant. It was like a sheepdog, really. Yeah, the, that refused to uh, roll over and play dead. On the, yeah, the, the, the guy was like, I'm play dead. And the dog just went. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was not a hard put upon dog. No, sure. it was a very oh. happy dog. Yeah, um, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a sheepdog type dog and it was basically doing sheepdog tricks. <laughs> but other than that, yeah, acrobats and all sorts. Awesome. Cool. cool. So, yeah. so um, well, let's get on with the show. So back in 1987, uh, a very famous and uh, very clever person said, uh, it's easy when you've got all the information inside help, no investigation, no questions in the house, no give and take. There's a big bang in the city. We're all on the make. We're S-H-O-P-P-I-N-G. We're shopping. Was that Mr. Neil Tennant? It was. Right. And uh, (laughs) recently... Was this before I was born by any chance? 1987? Yeah. (gasps) I hate you. (laughs) (laughs) We need... 
older presenters. Um, <laughs> We've got three of them. <laughs> to get my jokes. <laughs> I've got quite a range. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so um, we recently had um, beta two of Ubuntu twelve ten being prepared. Should mm-hmm. be ready for this Thursday. And um, as part of that, loads of code landed rather late. Uh, and um, late, late, surprise, uh, surprise. Late, late as in about three weeks late, feature freeze being some time ago and user mm. interface freeze and documentation freeze all passed. And then loads of code landed a bit late. And one of the things that landed really late was a new lens uh, called the shopping lens. Mm-hmm. And it's been referred to as the Amazon lens or Amazon shopping uh, right. But it's generically called shopping lens or uh, more suggestions right. as uh, as it's actually rendered on the screen. It just says more suggestions. Mm. And uh, this has caused a bit of a brouhaha. <laughs> okay. So oh, yes. why a brouhaha? Well, what it does is, uh, or what the current implementation does, is uh, when you press the super key in uh, Unity, you get what's called the dash home. And there's a number of lenses, but the home one is the first one you see if you just press the super key. And the idea is that you start typing and you search for stuff and you search for files and applications and and whatever, music and video and whatever. And the idea is that it's all brought to that front screen. And the change is that Mm. now there's an additional section or category in there called more suggestions. And that shows you products that you could buy. Okay. this is the contentious thing products you could buy on from amazon. amazon uh products you could buy online from shops like amazon okay so there, amazon is, is only one of them there are oh, others okay. in there yes there are such as uh, the ubuntu one music store is one Ooh. and there are others in other territories okay but i only have access to ubuntu one music store and amazon in the uk right. in other countries people have access to other stores hmm. fair enough okay and so uh the contentious stuff relates to the fact that uh, uh, it's surfacing um, content from the internet in the dash rather than just your local stuff. Yes. Right? Uh, so it's going off to the internet. And there are some other issues relating to the fact that it's not covered by the privacy policy and the content's going over an unencrypted connection and there's no way to block it if um, there's like adult content in that store, for example. Right. So there's a number of like issues. And um, Okay. Mm. So... Is there a reason for Canonical doing this, making this lens? Of course. It was done for a bit of a laugh. Right. No. <laughs> the, reason, the reason it's done is to generate revenue. So okay. that's... Canonical basically get the referral fee for any sales made to that. Yeah, it's the same as like, you know, when bloggers put a, um, a, a link to, you know, I bought this from Amazon, and you click the link and yeah. it's got their tag in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that that uh, if you then buy, subsequently buy something, only if you buy something then Amazon give a portion to the person whose tag that is. Yeah. And so in this case, it's a canonical tag. So there's like two things. One is it's revenue generating for canonical. And the second thing is it puts extra stuff in yeah. the dash yeah. that could be quite handy. Could be handy. Yeah. Rather, okay. rather than you searching and getting a blank dash, you've at least got something or something related to what you might be looking at, looking for. Mm-hmm. So could other stores offer up their content to be added? Um, I guess so. If they have an API and um, we can hook into that. I mean, there's a bunch of them already that are hooked in um, and other stores could hook in. Yes. Right. So this is uh, the data that goes from a user's a user searches for uh, Cliff. Okay. They've got a file on their computer that is about the White Cliffs of Dover. Right. And then so they cite the search Cliff in the thing and up comes the context thing for a Cliff Richard album yeah. um, for Amazon. Well, there's, there's lots of things that could come up. So right. they might have like a, a folder called, you know, Cliff. Yeah. And in that folder might be all the files they received from a guy called Cliff. There might yeah. be his CV. There might be other stuff, you know, but all they typed was Cliff. There might be images of Cliffs, photos yep. that have come from Shotwell. Uh, there might be music, music, yeah, like you say, from Cliff Richard. Yep. But there might be music on their local machine. There yep. might be videos, you know, all kinds of stuff. But yes, also from this third party, there could be internet content. And that there's a query that goes off to Amazon, so Amazon will know what you're searching for. It doesn't go directly, for. does it? It goes via a, a web uh, service, a canonical web service. Correct. It and doesn't. It, it doesn't go encrypted. straight. It will be. Yeah. There's already a bug file that was filed like <laughs> within <laughs> a few minutes of uh, <laughs> of um, the code landing. Um, 
So is it a good thing or a bad thing that it goes via canonical servers? Well, <laughs> well it, it, I think the, the initial sort of accusation was that it's sending it to a third party like Amazon who, you know, they profile customers so they can, um, you know, suggest things that they might want to buy. Um, and this is, and you know, allowing them to do that from your desktop, essentially, when you might not be specifically searching for products. Mm. Whereas if it goes via Canonical, then it's Canonical that's searching for all these products. So it's not necessarily, a, you know, a, a user privacy thing. Mm. So, so for example, if if I'm I'm sat here on your IP address in your house, yes, and I do a search on my machine, then that is going to go from your IP to Canonical's uh, server in or servers in data centers around the world, yep. wherever they are, I don't know, um, and that then gets proxied to Amazon or all of these stores, and the results yes. come back to you. So. Amazon don't know your IP. Some stores do, because right. some stores require the IP to do GeoIP lookup. Okay. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, Amazon don't. So Canonical, do they track who's searching for what? Uh, or could they? I guess they, they could. could, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, do do they at the moment, do they have an interest in... I don't think the reporting, I don't think the reporting stuff exists yet. But the guy, right. I, and I believe yeah. the, well, the yeah. Is it, there's, I'm not, I'm not expecting you to answer this from a technical point of view, but yeah. there's two issues. If if Canonical is databasing uh, all of the lookups that people are making and perhaps trying to correlate them against information about that user, potentially, the sort of thing that Google does when mm. you're using Google, to yeah. be fair, that's one thing. But if it's just a, a service that isn't logged or you know, there's no record made of a search, then it's a different matter because it is just acting as a broker, essentially passing the yeah. message from one service to another just to provide a bit of extra anonymity. So I think there's explicitly that's not being done to report on a particular user. There's aggregated data, so we can say, okay, people are you know, searching a lot for this type of music or searching for those types of products or we get a lot of searches for videos or we get a lot of searches for music and, and the kind of aggregated data, but not specifically John Smith on this particular IP did these searches on these days not that right. kind of detail yeah. and not not the kind of detail that is personally identifiable either okay so um what are people getting worked up about other than the unencrypted connections well the one of the first sort of posts about this was on slash dot where the headline was that um ubuntu was basically being ad supported by default which to be fair given what we've just discussed i don't think that's a very fair representation of what it is because it's not like something is sort of profiling the stuff that you might like and then just popping up with suggestions it's you're searching for something and you're getting search results and you still don't have to buy it and you still don't have to buy well, you don't have to buy anything that you're advertised to but it's well, not uh... it's not like it's not the same sort of thing as an advert from Google on a, on the side of a website or, you know, Opera having Google ads in the, at the top of the browser like it used to. I can see why people yeah. have this uh, feeling that it is adverts because there is someone being paid, and it's not you, <laughs> it's canonical, someone being paid for getting that, that picture of an item mm -hmm. and a link on your machine. So I can see how that, that can be in, in some people's minds that that can correlate. Well, that's an advert then you're being paid to put content on my, yeah. my machine. Yeah. That's an advert. But then so is having the Ubuntu on music store in Banshee by that token. Well, in fact, this, this feature of looking up stuff online ha has already been in Ubuntu. You on, on 1204, you can go into the video lens and type, you know, um, little britain or something yeah. and you'll get videos show up and mm -hmm. if you're in some countries you'll get videos that are um pay for like amazon amazon video rental oh really yeah i didn't know you could do that and that's that's already been so there. well we can't do it in this country oh. but in other countries you can and if you look in the filter on the side of the video lens yeah. that's been there for a while it shows you a list of all the the, the sources and some i've never heard of some of these are like i mean there's obviously ones like the bbc iplayer and yeah. ted and stuff like that but there are there are third parties mm. that we're sending users to already and so we're getting a cut of that is this is the difference then that it's on the home 
Yeah, so of I the dash. So. That, is that the thing I that people are getting main, upset about? The main contentious thing is that not it's it's partly because it's on the main home screen. Yeah, uh, the dash, and partly because it's every search term. Yeah. So you know, if you've got lots of videos with words that you know are something we wouldn't utter on this show, um, or you know, stuff that. Yeah. But you might not want people to know. So an yeah. example that some people have given is, well, what if I'm you know, in a doctor's practice and I've got all my file names are my patient name and the disease that they have, you know, <laughs> and, and I search for John Smith syphilis or something, then, you know, I'm passing John Smith syphilis to canonical server. So, you know, there, there's, a, there's a, um, a question there about, you know, do, do users really want to have that kind of data surface yeah. to a mm. to a third party this can, it feels like a kind of boundary thing as well in that this is my machine and there's a boundary around it it's my personal machine and when i do a google search i know that i'm sending that data out there mm. whereas when i'm doing a as you said the search on the home dash thing um it's it's, to, it's meant to stay within my machine because that's what i'm searching mm. well that, that's what it is at the moment yeah when you say it's meant to <laughs> well, that's what I'm that's intending to it to. I'm intending to search my local right. machine. But your 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 machine, in inverted commas, leaks information. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, all over the place when you're when you're browsing stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, when you go to Google, they do all sorts of data mining on you, and so do Amazon. When but, you go to their website, they do all kinds of data mining on you. Yet this isn't. Oh, but it's not the... so much that. It's about whether you understand that. Sure, and and one of the bugs I think was filed that that requested. That there be a, um, a, a kind of disclaimer or a you know a, an agreement uh, when you first log in or when you first okay. install or when you mm. first sign in that says hey you're going to get this content surfaced on the dash you know you need to click through to agree to that or you know you might want to switch it off and in fact uh, Didier who works at Canonical has been working today on a feature to allow you to turn it on and off and turn turn remote searches on and off in any of the lenses without having to uninstall the package yeah the mo- okay. i mean the model could just be like when you get apps on your phone and you have to authorize it to connect yeah and you know generally in, in inverted commas normal people just go yeah and, and click okay and don't really read all of that and and some of the argument is well we're not normal people you know at the moment we're the, we're the kind of people actually who are advocates for your software advocates for free software and those kind of people are very privacy aware and and very aware of the kind of data that goes over networks and you know and and they're not going to advocate something which does something that goes against their ideas of what you know free software should do do we think it it would put people off if you are a new ubuntu user or new to ubuntu uh, you are shown this uh unity interface and you're shown how you can search for files or applications and there are adverts for products that you know you don't own um so you know that they're adverts is that a negative factor do people think it could be because perceived as ad supported and go oh well you know i don't want to see lots of adverts everywhere it's a tricky one i don't know Mm. i mean you know i've known this has existed for a little while um you know because i work for canonical and and i've thought long about it you know what what would users think and i'm not sure I'm, i'm really not sure how people react to it i know that there's a lot of um, dissent uh, both inside our community and we've received a lot of flack from people who are not within our community and I'm, I, when I say I'm not within our community I mean people who are running completely different distros not contributing to Ubuntu at all you know outside the community but within the free software world mm. who are giving us a lot of flack for this mm. and so um, but they're not <laughs> it sounds harsh they're not our target audience yeah. People yeah. are already running free software. They're not a target audience. Target audience is people who walk. I've said this before. People who walk into PC World and buy a computer. Mm. Would they be annoyed by this? Hmm. They already get you know on Windows. They already get pop ups saying you know upgrade to Norton Antivirus, blah, and, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. subscribe to AOL. And we don't want to yeah. go down that road. No. But this thing has to be financed somehow. I have no problem with the financing part of it. Personally, it's like well, no. it's not like I've paid for the the software, and this is another way to contribute money for the software and, right yeah um yeah no i think i think so i think i can see why people might be a bit uh it's my as i said before my it's local my search yeah. um but then only if you think about it and it's the same with the google thing it's only when you think about it that you go they've, they know a lot about me 
But most of the time you don't think about it. Yeah. Mm. Whether that's right or wrong is a different issue. Mm. But the fact is I'm comfortable with Google knowing about my entire life, it seems. Um, so it's yeah. just a matter of getting over it. And, yeah, so <laughs> Mark Shuttleworth said in his blog post, you know, we already have root on all your machines. <laughs> yeah, yes. that was a bit unfortunate. I, I, I think <laughs> that, that was really worded. Yeah, I think that was a turn of phrase. I mean, I can see where he's coming from. What he's trying to say is that, okay, if you... If you're trying to say you don't trust Canonical, you already then, do. Basically. Then yeah. you know there is implicit trust by the fact that yeah. the software that you're running on your machine was packaged, sometimes developed, or well, a lot of it yeah. was, you know, developed by people who work for if us. If they wanted and to backdoor it, they could have done it easily. <laughs> if yeah. we wanted to screw you up, we could have done it a long, long time ago. But mm. that's that's not really you know that that's it's more of an argument that surely we're doing we're we're doing what we can in in the interests of our users. Yeah. Um, yes, indeed. A super engineer in our IRC channel says that he wonders how many people complaining are aware of what their smartphones are doing in the background. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> yes, which Quite is definitely worth thinking about. Well, I mean, the thing is, some of these some of these people who are complaining are the kind of, you know, what you might call refuseniks who, who won't have smartphones yeah. or will have a smartphone but won't sign into Google when they, when they enable it right. or... Um, or we'll have ad blockers and JavaScript blockers and, you know, all kinds of other, and we'll surf the internet through Tor. Okay. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's, there's room in, on, in the internet for people like that. But the, you know, the fact is that the vast majority of people don't do that. Yeah. Cool. Well, if you have got a thought or two about the uh, Ubuntu shopping brouhaha, <laughs> send us in your feedback podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. And now it's time for the news. After recent outages, GitHub has shared details of the cause of the downtime. What was it? Um, uh, upgrading to a bigger MySQL cluster and something fell apart when they turned some of it on. And yeah. Oh. Yeah. Right. It's a bit pretty, unfortunate. Pretty it was, yeah. it was <laughs> sort of down first thing in the morning a week or so ago. How long was it down for? Um, I think it was down all morning. Well, as this, I remember, this is our top news item. <laughs> <laughs> it matches a to webso- a lot of a lot of open source projects. A website was down a while ago. <laughs> it's all right now, though. News at eleven. <laughs> Bong. <laughs> it's war. <laughs> <laughs> the CTO of Alibaba.com, Wang Huan, I think, has accused Google of straying from its motto of "Don't be evil." Wang's comments were prompted when Ace's decision to pull out of a joint launch with Alibaba. For a phone running Alien OS, a system Google claims is derived from but incompatible with Android. Wang claims Google put pressure on ASO using their agreement as a member of the Open Handset Alliance. So basically yeah. the agreement apparently says that if you're a member of the Open Handset Alliance, you can't ship incompatible versions of Android, which this Alien OS is purported to be. Right. Right. So that's why all those um, manufacturers out in China are probably not members of uh, the Open Handset Alliance, so they can ship tablets that have got like wacky, hacked-up versions of Android. Or I guess so. But, then, but even then, they're still compatible, so it's not a problem. But this was very hacked up in some way. Yeah, well, um, I think it's, yeah, it's sort of supposed to be Android-compatible, but they don't actually say it's Android. it's derived from Android. Right, okay. Mm. In more GitHub news. What? Oh, bring it on. Uh, a lawsuit has been launched against Rackspace Hosting, claiming, among other things, that its hosting of GitHub breaches several patents. Well, joy, a patent story. This is Ooh. its a pretty wacky sort of. You go through the article and it's uh, the. Whatever, the filing, and it goes through a list of patents and says that they're, the Rackspace breaches them by use of its Rackspace cloud server product and its GitHub hosting product. So they seem to think that Rackspace own GitHub or something. It's quite confusing. So is there a patent on cloud hosting? No, there, it's some sort of funny data storage thing, apparently. I've not read the patents in detail because, you know. <laughs> Method for storing some data on a disk. <laughs> Patent number 4553321. Five, in happy news, a new Humble Bundle offer has begun alongside the release of Nikki and the Robots. Oh, um, have I read, jumped past it? Yeah, Sorry, keep line. going. Just keep Nobody going. Nobody will notice. Oh. Well, Mark noticed, uh, <laughs> alongside the release of Nikki and the Robots, an independent platform game available under a similar pay-what-you-like scheme. 
Excellent. And this is through the Ubuntu Software Center. Again, yes. Excellent. So you can, and they've just added some more games to it, Ooh. which is good. Mm. Can you pay what you want through the Software Center? No, you, you go to Humble Bundle. <laughs> no, you pay, a, you pay Canonical £100 and they pay the. And we will pass on all of your money. <laughs> <laughs> no, you go to Humble account. Bundle and then you get a link. Right, right. okay. Cool. It's been revealed that a Wikimedia trustee and a Wikipedian in residence, two highly trusted position in the Wikipedia community, have edited Wikipedia pages on behalf of PR clients. Oh. Wikipedia founder Jimmy Wales described the act as wildly inappropriate. I found it as, like, not even remotely surprising, or is that just my... <laughs> I, I was like... It is sure. a wiki. Yeah. Mm. You're not allowed to do... Are the community guidelines that yeah, yeah. That was yeah sure but uh, you know, conflict of interest of, I think it falls under wasn't really yeah. surprised when, when you've got Gibraltar as the featured article for something like four that days out of seven yeah. in a week yeah it was yeah <laughs> awesome right. Gibraltar marketing board or something yes. was the PR client yeah. was it right okay <laughs> and finally in the news developers of the Vivaldi tablet running the Plasma Active Interface have been forced to look at new hardware options of the tablet's release after being let down by manufacturers hmm. Yeah, so oh, apparently they, they sort of got everything agreed and then they went back to look at the sort of final hardware and it was somewhat substandard from what they thought they'd agreed, so they're okay. going elsewhere. Ooh, but hopefully we'll see something eventually. Cool. And that's the end of the news. And we've got some events. We Ooh. have SkyCon coming up on the 6th and 7th of October. Not long now. No. I'm going. You're speaking. <laughs> yeah, I am. You can hear me. Oh, I see at the at the conference. Oh, well, hey, you flying there? Uh, no, I'm going in a plane. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness <laughs> sake! <laughs> Comedy gold. gold. And if that's not enough for you, Hack Manchester is at the 27th and 28th of October. It's a 24-hour coding competition. Uh, teams of four people are going to be coding at the Museum of Science and Industry as part of the Manchester Science Festival. Um, so yeah, go along to that. Cool. And that's all the events we've got time for this time. Hello, and welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners, wherever you are around the British Empire, or indeed the Isle of Sheppey. And it's a good day to our charming hostess, Miss Deirdre Morris-Oxford. Good day, Douglas. And what item of tomorrow's technology have you for us, uh, today? In the very near future, people will be taking all forms of exercise in private gymnasia with some marvellous new items of equipment. For example, the exercise bicycle without wheels. Without wheels? How do you get anywhere? You don't go anywhere, Douglas. It's for taking anaerobic exercise through the motion of pedalling. What's wrong with getting on a real bicycle and going somewhere? That's what I did in my youth, touring France. You rode the Tour de France. The what? The Tour de France. Oh, Tour de France. Well, I rode a Tour of France, not the Tour. Ah, great days. A good bottle of Beaujolais in every village. The views from the Pyrenees. A near miss with a French farmer's donkey cart going off the road and falling down the side of an alp, and nursed back to health by a French milkmaid. Falling down a mountain on a bicycle. Weren't you injured? Only slightly. Beaujolais is a marvellous muscle relaxant. Uh, it's all very character building. Well, soon you'll be able to take exercise without those physical hazards. With the scenery projected on a screen inside the gymnasium, you can take it all in without having to travel. Locked in an airless room, in forced exercise, Dressed in your vest and pants, it sounds like my old school. This is much more scientific, Douglas, with devices to monitor your heart rate, lung capacity, miles travelled. You could just as well play a game of cricket, or lawn tennis, or croquet. Croquet is not an anaerobic exercise. <laughs> it is the way my Aunt Regina plays it. My word, it's terrifying. She learned to play in Afghanistan. Do you know that the Afghan tribesmen play with their... That's all from tomorrow's technology today. Toodle pip and God save the king.
episodes ago, we brought you a fantastic competition to win a copy of Ubuntu Made Easy, a book that we reviewed in that self-same episode. It is now time to go over the entries. I haven't, I haven't got the <laughs> mood music. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, we're going to talk about some of the suggestions that we received uh, as part of our competition. The competition um, was, sorry, the question of the competition was to tell us in 140 characters or less or fewer, I can't remember which is the right way, um, to tell us what you would do, what one thing you would do to uh, make the Ubuntu desktop better. I think we said Ubuntu better. Make Ubuntu you, better, not yes. just a desktop. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, Laura. Oh, okay, so we had some entries, um, and we're going to talk through, talk about some of them, and uh, see what we think, and then pick a winner. So, so listen, the first one, uh, Aaron Pearson. Yeah, he says Ubuntu should include a recommended YouTube channels list with a shortcut on the desktop. Interesting. So this could or be dash. sort of um, you could have a channel for Ubuntu tutorials, perhaps. Alan Pope mm. screencasts <laughs> half from, an hour from five years ago. Yes, the half an hour tutorial of Unity. How to install Ubuntu? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not a bad idea actually. And the problem, the problem with that, tying it to a specific vendor like YouTube is um, YouTube actually doesn't work in some countries. Really, it's, blo- oh, right. it's blocked in some places. Yes, places so, like China. Oh right, which is uh, you know that place where we have loads and loads of shops that are branded <laughs> Ubuntu and sell oh, yeah. computers running Ubuntu. Well, they must have an equivalent. It could be. It could be a careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, could Canonical host the videos themselves? <laughs> I don't think we want to get into that. <laughs> but but that's that's why we have a video lens. We have like loads of providers, mm. right? And you go to the video lens and you type what you want: mm. tuition, tutorial, you know. And that way, mm. we don't have to point to one provider, and it does GOIP lookup, so it's tailored for where you are. I guess there's two parts. One is actually having official tutorial videos produced because I think most yes. of the ones are community efforts at the moment. Well, there, it's funny. There, there's, um, there is a, a YouTube channel called Celebrate Ubuntu. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, and that's um, run by Canonical. Oh, um, who knew? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's run by the, um, the communications department. Right, okay. So when you see like some of those funky marketing videos, hmm. they'll be in that channel. Right. Um, and we don't have a lot of those, yeah. um, but we don't have a huge, um, you know, budget for creating no. tutorial videos. But thankfully, there's a huge community of people out there who do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's an interesting idea. So thank you for that one, Aaron. Yeah. Robert Maniki, not sure I pronounced that correctly, but I'm going to carry on anyway. Um, suggested that basically remove Unity, install GNOME Classic as the one thing. So it's all, <laughs> I didn't expect that one. Side. Always one. <laughs> To be honest, I was expecting... We we only got one. I was expecting wow. a lot more uh, people did suggesting Did we not say? I th- oh, yes, we did, didn't I we? I think yeah. we said on the first yes, one... Yes, you're not allowed to win. Don't, don't give us that one, because we know that. Yeah. <laughs> we know Maybe that Maybe it's been funny. Yeah. You see, the problem... What can you do? I mean... Gnome Classic doesn't exist. Gnome Classic is dead as a project. So yeah. blame Upstream for that one. <laughs> what, what are we supposed to do? Like, revive it like the Mint guys have, which is... Um, is it cinnamon or mate? Mm. I don't know. One of them is yeah. one of them is a fork of of what was gnome two, and yeah. is old and crafty and doesn't seem to get an awful lot of love. And the other one is a fork of gnome three. So what what's best is like all these different developers go off all around the world forking old stuff that everyone's moved on from and is now dead, or we create a new thing that actually is better than those things that were. Well, yeah, there's a bit of a uh, chicken and egg thing there because people wouldn't have to move off it if it was supported and and maintained properly. Yeah, but why 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 do people support stuff? Because they there there's a there's an itch to scratch because they want to yeah. get they want to they want to fix stuff or because someone's paying them to do it. Yeah, and nobody is paying developers to work on GNOME two, and nobody seems to be wanting to maintain it, which is why no. it's dead. But it doesn't. It, <laughs> Yeah, that's the situation at the moment. Somebody okay. could pay somebody oh, to maintain it. someone could revive it. it. Yeah. Someone could revive CDE if they really wanted to. You know, <laughs> they did, actually. They yeah, released it. It's okay. been sourced. <laughs> woo <Woo-hoo. Yeah. laughs> Yes, for the real The saviour of the Linux desktop is CDE. Yeah. Yes, okay, right. I, I don't think <laughs> so I, we've been that one. Well, Next! <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to win an argument about unity with Alan. <laughs> right, Laura, who's next? 
I don't know. I can't see. No. John Vavole? Oh, yeah. Johan, I suspect. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I completely missed the letter out there. Yeah, Johan Vavole. Um, you have to install Ubuntu yourself on hardware you already use. Difficult. I would make it easy to deliver it pre-installed. Interesting. So I think what he's saying is that half the battle is installing it yes. yourself as a, a mm. barrier to adoption. Yeah. So to make it easy is to have it pre-installed. Yeah. Which I agree with. I think I yeah. think everyone does, really. I think it's one of those things that the easiest thing to do would be to walk into a shop and, you know, there's the aisle of, you know, uh, Windows laptops, there's the aisle of Apple laptops, and then there's the um, aisle of... Ubuntu laptops. Ubuntu laptops. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it could happen. That, that's what it should be, or you know, or a huge variety of things. Or maybe there should be uh, a series of laptops, yeah. and then you know, you choose. It costs this much with Windows. It costs this much with OS ten. It costs this much with Ubuntu. Yeah, yeah. And for sake of argument, this much with Red Hat Fedora. No. Well, <laughs> well, we're making Ubuntu easier. Yeah. We're not making the others oh, easier. That's true, yeah. Fair the, others, the others can stay difficult as far as we're concerned. <laughs> well, there it's a bit is of a partisanship. But, but I think that that would be the right way to go is to have, you know, choice. And, and in yes. fact, I've said this before Dell, the, almost every single machine in their line mm. is certified to run ubuntu they all mm. run ubuntu fine mm. um all the machines that they sell right now run ubuntu just fine but the problem is that in the various regions around the world the heads of those regions just currently choose not to put those out on show on the website is there anything yeah. from a technical point of view that could be done to make it easier to deliver ubuntu pre-installed or do you think it's just a, a marketing or mind share? Or... Well, it's partly a technical issue in that the hardware has to be supported. Yeah. But that's why we have people working in the Far East, is to work with the device manufacturers and make sure that the stuff does work. Right. Um, so that right at the source, where the actual you know chips are put on the boards, we know it works all the way over there. So by the time it gets to be in a cardboard box on your desk and you take it out, you know everything's going to work. Um, so that that is being worked on. Um, I, I don't think, in terms of, I don't think necessarily mm. there are technical issues. They're, they're you know, issues to try and get the desktop to work in a way at, that that users want, and work in a way that the people who are selling it, the salespeople at you know Dell and all these other mm. Lenovo, HP, Acer, and Asus, and, and all the others, those people want to sell it. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I'm not sure that's a that's a technical problem. No. No. Right, Laura, who's next? Chris Giltnane says for non techie users, a GUI for creating and maintaining FS tab and auto FS files for connecting to home network NASIs. I was actually thinking about something like this being handy the other day because um my girlfriend just bought a new laptop and I was just trying to set up some sort of um network share so that she can have her stuff on a server and just put it down to her laptop when she needs it yeah um and it all involves hacking around setting up samba shares and hoping that you've got the permissions right and everything like that there's no way of just saying oh there's some there's a file system over there i'd like that here without going around into files and knowing really? knowing what you're looking for are you, are you talking at the client end or the server end um both. You can set up, uh, well, they've got a bookmark, which is a, yeah. a, 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 a server, but it doesn't automatically mount it when you log in. You have to click it, which is okay if you are if you are in just using the UI. Mm. But if you have an application that w- w- might want to open a file like on a yeah, that, that location, thing. you have to make sure it's mounted properly before you can use the application to access it. So there is a little bit of, it, it could be a better experience, I think. Um it's fine for media that you plug directly into your machine because that all auto mounts and is yeah. lovely. But uh, yeah, I, I've, or you either end up editing uh, file system tables or, or you know, trying to put some other cludge in place. Checkbox on those bookmarks that says auto mount. The thing is, <laughs> a lot of the time works. it's not even mounted. It's Nautilus doing a yeah. bit of clever wizardry over the top. Uh, um, which Why yeah. does it need to be mounted? I mean, when I say mounted, you're you're saying mounted at a specific point in the file system slash MNT or slash media or something. Why why does it have to be there? Why can't it be that in Nautilus there's an icon and you click on it and that's my media folder that's somewhere on the network? 
it depends on the application. A lot of applications will play nicely with uh, a document, say, that's stored on a, a share that's viewed through Nautilus. Right. Some things just don't like those shares. Mm. They don't know how to address them. Um, so it's more perhaps about the application level support. Okay, so those are bugs that need fixing? Uh, potentially, yes. Because, you know, if I... If I um, <laughs> so what I tend to do, if I want to watch a film that I've ripped from a DVD or something that you are that's, that's on my seat on my server uh, I would uh, open Nautilus and I would just click browse network mm-hmm. and then I click home server media film and then I click the film uh, more recently I've just started running XBMC and using a remote control but if I'm on my desktop I'll just like navigate so through hold the on how's it how's it shared on your home server Samba and how did you set that up through the guru. Uh, no, I edited ETC, SMB, blah, blah, blah. There we go. So there is no guru. Yeah, so this is why I asked client or server side. Client yeah, yeah. side, easy. Server side, webmin. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, but it's a good suggestion, yeah? I, saw, I think. Yeah, um, yeah definitely it is. Bears worth uh, thinking about. Uh, yeah. Albert is lava has suggested an overlay with arrows and descriptions of all the icons and buttons with the links for more information and help. And he sent us a screenshot that he's mocked up um, to illustrate his point, which he does admit probably takes him over 140 characters. <laughs> <laughs> so this is sort of like the wow. shortcuts overlay that you get the moment when you hold down the home key. Yes. yes. But it points at the bits of the interface and tells you what they are. Oh, I'm looking at the, sc- the screenshot. It's quite a... It's comprehensive. It's comprehensive. It's a nice idea. Yeah. It like would be good trash if... where files go before they're permanently deleted <laughs> <laughs> it like would that. be good if the thing popped up as you hovered over it rather than all of them being on there all the time and I'm not sure that's what he's suggesting no but... I don't think he is okay good mm. suggestion yeah I like that I, 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 mean, I, I genuinely like that because it, it just gives you a one place what everything is yeah Computers like geeks like baked goods, coffee, and or that. beer. Please trade one or more of those to help with your computer. Excellent. <laughs> oh, these are tips. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Right. <laughs> one of the tips is I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> At least he's I like honest. That. I like that tip. I like that. Uh, Chris said, "I think Ubuntu would be easier to use without the need to use command line." Well, yeah. I think yep. it would be easier to use if you learnt the command line. <gasps> Ooh. We should, we should have, um, yeah. we should uh, find a bug and say remove the terminal <laughs> and have like a spin of Ubuntu that has no terminal and switches off all the TTYs. Interesting. Mm. Or maybe just have a, a package you install, which is, you know, it's called, I don't know, dumb and dumber dot dev or something. <laughs> even that, even like... Mac OS has the terminal by default installed. I have yeah. no problem with the terminal being there. I just don't want to have to use it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and and some people have said new. I think we've said numerous times. You know, if you have to use the terminal, it's a bug. You know, yeah. and if you no, okay, yeah, if you have to use the terminal, it's a bug. Yeah, yeah. okay. I think if you want to use it as, as a shortcut because it's more efficient for you, that's mm. fine. Yeah, and copy so and pasting, you, you know, an instruction on how to do something. Yeah. It, it is easy. We've we've covered this a lot yeah. in the mm-hmm. past, but I, I would love to see it if there was a, a possibility to have a system that you know where we. <laughs> almost never use the command line you know if, if if over time you could plot the number of the number of times you've executed gnome terminal or that you've switched to a tty zero and see that the number of times goes down and down and down over that would be good aiming for zero the only time i use mm-hmm. it at work is for our desktop i think and Why? then there i just front got up that. up <laughs> yeah yeah but it didn't work it didn't have the options i needed yeah, yeah. Fine, that, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> hassle <laughs> Okay. I do that at work. Uh, yeah, to, and to file a bug, you use... Uh, you go to the help menu and choose report a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 12 months ago, that would have been open up a terminal and type report <laughs> bug. I had a bug the other day, but I can't, I can't remember what it is, but it was really annoying me. Okay. And I know Alan would tell me <laughs> Thanks to Thanks for sharing. Cool story, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Videsh has uh, sent his suggestion. I would encourage Ubuntu to create standard-looking application front ends. In this way, from release to release, the GUI for all applications would look consistent and would have an integrated look with Unity while the back end can be easily changed out. I realise this is the way Mac does it, but it's one of its strengths. So more sort of having... Consistency. Um, yes, yeah, like, like interface. Yes, an interface sort of style guide for... Yeah, Unity apps, I suppose. That's true. Yeah. There isn't one, is there? Um, there are, there's a, a, a guidelines for GNOME applications, yes. which obviously Pig. a lot are in. Yes. 
But it's quite different from yeah. that now. Uh, I don't think I don't think we do have one. They're uh, certainly not consistent at the moment. We don't have a Unity Hig. We might have one. And I mean, you couldn't if you're writing a standard no map that's to go in all the different distributions. How could you? Well, you'd have well, to assume that they're mm. using GNOME the way GNOME intended. Yeah. As, mm. soon, as soon as you, you know, rip out huge chunks of it and replace it with, you know, something yeah. else, then, you know, you've kind of broken that a little bit. Yeah. But, you, I mean, you, there are guidelines. You can still use them as guidelines. Not necessarily, you know, a rule book to throw at people. Yeah. Right. Okay. The time has come oh. to make a decision about who we should want to be our winner. Once we've excluded people who emailed the wrong email address, people who have typed more than 140 characters. And, and people who were wrong. And people who, <laughs> people who Mark disagrees with. Right. Um, I, he, I, I love these because we always get like super interesting and, and yeah. really wacky thoughts from, you know, people. And these are, you know, people's genuine use cases. And I think, yeah. I think the one that stands out for me, even though I kind of disagree with it, is the one from Chris about the GUI for maintaining stuff like that. Yeah, I like that. One. I think that would be my choice for a winner as well. I yeah. can count the characters if you want. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure it's 140. Well, while you're doing that. Phew. With is. spaces, it's 117. Oh, so excellent. Good. Okay, cool. Okay, well, congratulations, Chris. You're our winner for this uh, competition. If you email us in your address, Alan will post the book out to you. Uh, Eventually. At the first available opportunity. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> There's a promise. <laughs> And now it's time for a bit of bit of Ubuntu. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is. Um, so the community winners of the Ubuntu app showdown have been announced. Who won? I don't know. Uh, there, were, there were three winners and I couldn't tell you. Uh, follow the One link in the show notes. Second, One of them the was a religious calendar which tells you the dates of various feasts, I think. Oh, I like the sound of that. <laughs> so these were Just voted a... for by members of the community. That was second place. Or with Cal. Big fan of feasts. Third place was. I, mean, I like other ice cream as well, but. Third place was Cuttlefish. Oh, that's the um, a sort of if this then that, but for the desktop. That's quite cool. It's... I like that. What? What? Uh, sorry. Yes. If, if this then that dot com is a is the a website. sort of yeah, it's a website for sort of linking APIs together. So you can say, oh, if someone tweets and it's got this in, then fire off this job on another service. So this is sort of like that for your desktop. So you can link into different. I know what he's talking about. We're just not with it anymore, Alan. Just because I look clueless doesn't mean I am. <laughs> it's been about for about 12 months. <laughs> wow. So yeah, Cuttlefish is quite cool. And who won? Ridual. As the application with highest score, Ridual gets the top position as the piece of software most loved by the voters. Ridual gives you back a classic in modern form, a dual pane file manager. Oh, God, yeah. This oh, was, yeah. Um, Isn't it's like, that Wing Commander or yeah. something? <laughs> Wing Commander! <laughs> Midnight, Midnight Commander. Commander. Midnight Commander. <laughs> yeah. I, that was the one I was just kind of, wow. I didn't really like Midnight Commander. What about the Wing Commander? It's all right. <laughs> Makes me laugh. Oh. Okay. Right. What's next? Um, Quetzal Beta 2 is landing, including the shopping lens, as we've discussed. Indeed. <laughs> yes. Uh, Amazon and Ubuntu One Music Store links in the launcher by default, as we've discussed. No, we haven't, actually. Oh, is that... Did we not? Oh, in the launcher. Yeah. Oh, so there's going to be icons oh. for them. <laughs> yeah, Ooh. down here. So there'll be an icon for a bunch of our music store underneath. Yeah, Alan your gestures office. to the wars, the left hand side of Libra the screen. Libra office uh, here, here, and here uh, down the left. And hand I side. assume that the Amazon link will automatically tag your session with canonicals. Certainly does. Mm. Okay, it's all about which, the money. which costs you nothing. Yeah. And takes you straight to Amazon, and you can Except buy your stuff. Freedom and liberty. Is it going to? <laughs> oh, Amazon, if you're going to Amazon already, <laughs> does Amazon link in with the new Unity Web Apps API? Uh, I don't know actually. Because if it does, then that's cool. I bought Ooh. some batteries. Today. I bought some batteries yesterday. Today, using this uh, oh. Amazon Lens thing. Oh. Yeah, so I'm helping Ooh. pay my own salary. <laughs> 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 oh no that's a good reason to avoid <laughs> <laughs> he's got to pay for petrol to get down here somehow yeah, yeah. that's true you got to which is lot, then paying for the batteries <laughs> <laughs> so he's contributing it back to the community yeah or something yeah okay carry right. on mark 
Um, oh, oh and oh, there's yeah. finesse, finesse of the dash. Yes, if you look at um, mm-hmm. if you look at the technical overview uh, notes uh, for beta two, uh, you'll see there is a boatload of little fixes. They had a design sprint um, a week or so before. Uh, beta 2 but after feature freeze and, <laughs> of course. and after, well after user interface freeze unfortunately it's the best time to do it in um, my experience and um, fix loads of stuff the good thing that came out of it fix loads of stuff excellent cool. so yeah loads of little you know yeah. niggly things where things weren't placed right or um, you know the size of stuff wasn't quite right or didn't match the design so they you know had a blast and fixed a load of them mm. cool yeah. In other news, the OpenStack Foundation has been officially launched with Canonical as a Platinum member. Didn't we mention this last no, week? We, no, we mentioned that um, VMware... Yeah, other people oh, were, going yes. were going for it. But now it's more important because we are. <laughs> right. Yes. yes. Yeah. But it's still not made it to the news. It, just because it's, it's about a about Canonical Ubuntu. thing, so it's about, <laughs> bit Ubuntu. about Ubuntu. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and Mike Hall is looking for help to build a new documentation portal for Ubuntu app developers. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. So this is where this whole, where I was thinking this whole Unity Human Interface Guidelines kind of stuff, uh, that yeah. kind of documentation could fit in there. And yeah. also, this is more documentation about, you know, APIs and how you get started with developing apps on Unity and how you use the indicators and how you use the thing on the side. And Michael's actually developed a little app that, um, I think it's called I Love Unity, I think. <laughs> um, or No, Hello Unity. It's uh. called Hello Unity. And it's a little app that... Um, lets you trigger various things on the screen, like trigger an indicator or trigger a launcher icon, and then see the code behind that that makes that happen. So you can oh, like cool. make something happen and then go, oh, that's how you do it. Right, copy and paste that code out. <laughs> it's just like a load of code samples. It's really good. Hmm. Sure. Laura. I know. <laughs> I'm, wow. like, I'm leaving a just... nice little pause. And then... Dead air is a crime. <laughs> 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 So, details of Ubuntu's secure boot implementation have been updated, and the implementation will now use Grub2. Woohoo! So, this was after the initial announcement saying there were concerns over Grub2's GPL3 licensing, um, meaning that they might have to release their private key, which would sort of make it mm-hmm. pointless. There was but a then, about that, yes. Yeah, but then the Free Software Foundation said, actually, no, that's all right. What's you secure boot about? This is. Um, so that uh, it's a Windows, it's a Microsoft um, oh, it, it requirement, but it's implemented in UEFI, yes. which is so the it, replacement for the BIOS. Um, <laughs> and there was a lot of uh, worry that Linux wouldn't be able to be installed on machines that had Secure Boot yes. by default. Um, and so each Linux vendor has come up with a solution and we got a kicking when we first said we weren't going to use Grub2, we were going to use something else. I think some Intel bootloader or something yeah, which that I was licensed was it, differently. Yeah, it wasn't entirely open source or something at the time. Yeah, it was licensed differently and we got a kicking because we didn't use Grub2 and now we're getting a kicking because we've changed our minds and now we are using <laughs> Grub2. So you yeah, grun. <laughs> Do you think the community are the own, their own worst enemy sometimes? <laughs> It's not, it's not the community that are giving us the kicking, it's everyone else. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, blame the community. <laughs> oh, well, as long as we can keep booting Ubuntu, that's all yes. we really care about. People are always booting Ubuntu. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of the bit about Ubuntu. We've got no bit about anything else. People can complain about that. And now, oh, sorry. <laughs> and Go now. on. You could have just carried on. No one would have known. And now. Go on. <laughs> Don't let us stop you. Feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Roger Light emailed us to let us know that we, except for me, were all wrong about the point in the desktop is dead section last episode. The point that Linus and Alan Cox made about the kernel being happy to break compatibility is purely down to the internal interfaces. The external interfaces don't change. The problem is that the internal interfaces include drivers. For drivers that don't live in the kernel tree, especially closed source drivers, this is where the pain lies as they don't automatically get refactored. The GNOME team, on the other hand, were changing their external interface. It's completely clear now. 
<laughs> and sorry, yes. Roger, that had to be hugely edited down. So I hope it still makes the sense that it made when you started. <laughs> Have you completely changed the meaning of what you said? I did get Mark to review it. <laughs> right. As long Good. as it's clear that I was right, then that's... Oh, well, that's okay then. Uh, yeah. So this is perhaps equivalent to somebody changing... Uh, the way that the GNOME libraries work that means that all the other applications would have to be changed. Yes. It, it's not the same as somebody doing some internal gubbins within the kernel. No. It's more like changing the, some fundamental system call that means all of the command line applications would have to be changed. Exactly. Right. Don't change anything, that's what I say. <laughs> Stop me. <laughs> Stu Siddons, a, self- a self-proclaimed Ubuntu noob who runs um, Ubuntu in VMware on his iMac... Also emailed us. I run it alongside OS X simply because it has such an incredible array of useful and free software. I can find an Ubuntu application to help me chop up an MP3, convert something to something else, back up protected DVDs, all in a matter of minutes. For free! Best of all, the comments people put on the forums and reviews are worth their weight in gold compared to those on the more common platforms. I can't honestly see myself ever taking the full plunge and becoming a person who only has Ubuntu because I don't feel I'll ever have that critical mixture of confidence in Linux to easily and reliably deliver my requirements and confidence in my own skills to work around the little issues that pop up from time to time. I think that comes with um, time. Uh, uh, beard growth. Yes. <laughs> neck, neck beard growth. Oh, but, s- sorry, Laura, go sorry. on. Also, the examples that he gives of things that he uses Ubuntu for are things that don't come as standard as far as I know. No, yeah, but what he's like, saying is yeah, that yeah. Yeah, for any utility that he mm. needs, he knows he can just go into um, Ubuntu Software Center and search for a chop MP3 or something and find it and see the yeah. reviews. And Yeah, but he's, he, he said he's worried about being able to sort of self-support, but he's already right. doing more complicated things in Ubuntu than most people would do in yeah. Ubuntu. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> He's already an expert user. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's obviously found the forums and things like that and been able to yeah. use yeah. them to support. Mm. So I think, Steve, he's, go on. You know he's you want to do it. Do it. <laughs> It's an iMac as well. I've got Ubuntu on my iMac. It works fine. Yeah. Do it, do it, and then email in to tell us how yeah. well it went. Go for it, Stu. Cool. And that's the end of your feedback. And that's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers, Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts around Ubuntu and the community around it. And join us on Tuesday the 9th of October for our next live broadcast. You did very well, Laura. You managed to not corpse during the outro. Thank you. My mum commented that we'd, we'd been very immature when we'd laughed in the last couple of episodes. Oh, and, oh dear. dear. I know. Sorry, mum. <laughs> <laughs> ah, dear. There we go. So thank you for listening, everybody. And, yes. When's uh, the next episode? It's on Tuesday the 9th of October. As I said. Yeah, I wasn't listening. <laughs> Two, weeks. <laughs> Two weeks. Two weeks, as ever. Yes. See you yes. then, everybody. Bye. Yes, thanks Bye. for listening. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Amy Ferguson. <laughs> <laughs>